I got a riddle for you. What does slavery, the Confederacy, the Ku Klux Klan, and Jim Crow all have in common? Did you guess Democrats? Because the answer is fucking Democrats. Every time who I am, what I am, I'm a man. Six shooters in both my hands. I'm a cold blood brother, a real bad mother. Watch out, honey, if I am. Welcome back to another episode of Revved Up. As the nation burns like your mama's cooking, the youthful, useless idiots, terroristic tantrums grips the Gadsden Rattler with the ominous promise that they will indeed tread on us. Yes, it looks like we're currently witnessing the graduation of the pink-haired pinko pussies from their critical race and gender theory studies into their critical race and gender theory wars. While we spent years mocking them for the multitudinous range of barista opportunities awaiting their future, we may have overlooked the possibility that our educational institutions were never preparing them for employment, but instead for enlistment. Not in the militaristic sense for the protection of our nation, that would be too jingoist, but instead in the revolutionary sense for the destruction of our nation. Now before we get going, I just want to remind everyone to hit that like button, and if you haven't already yet, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell, because we all know it's voices like mine that are first to get taken out back and old yellered by the folks at Big Tech. And now the best thing you can do is just share this video. But if you'd like to help support this channel, there are several ways to contribute down in the description below. I've had several very generous donations recently that I'm extremely thankful for, but anything you can help contribute is a huge help, and all donations do go to improving the show. Now that the shameless plugs are out of the way, let's talk race relations and the Democrats' age-old dictum of divide and conquer. Now, I know what a lot of you are thinking. Who wants to listen to a diatribe on race relations from a dude who's whiter than Casper the Ghost wrestling Frosty the Snowman over a bowl of vanilla ice cream? Well... Yes, and as an American citizen with both tongue and testicles, I outright refuse the supposition that my relevance has passed its expiration date due to the immutable genetic sequencing of my pigmentation, or lack thereof. Why? Because... Yes, it is racist. Because when lexicographers Merriam and Webster charted racism on their map of the English language, it was conspicuously devoid of power structure qualifiers and the mental gymnastics of rationalization because it is a universal evil to be condemned whole cloth, no matter the form or function it may take. Though I did just hear that in another show of corporate cuckery, even they have bent the knee and redefined racism in their dictionary, because that's what leftists do. They bastardize language and they bend it to their will. Just look what they did with socialism. Now it just means anything, anything funded by the government is socialist, right? <sighs> but racism isn't evil simply because power structures historically formed between once geographically and culturally disparate groups of people. That's a natural byproduct of tens of thousands of years of tribal competition ingrained in pre-integrated humanity. Racism is evil because, in a post-integrated world, we now know better that all men are created equal under the eyes of God, and to deny that is to deny a man of his inherent humanity, his divine self, and his holy purpose. It simply ain't Christian of us. Now, I'm not here to say that racism doesn't exist, that it's gone the way of the dinosaurs, but what I am saying is that we as a nation, through the inspiration of our founding principles, have made the greatest strides on earth to diminishing those tribal ticks that are inherent in all of us. At this point in time, racism in America is at a drizzle. But to hear the media tell it, you'd think we were experiencing an end of days hurricane. Now, before you all jump on me, let me tell you a little bit about my past. When I was in Atlanta, I worked a lot in the rap game. I shot music videos for black artists. I hung out at black clubs, black recording studios, black parties, all the time. Not once was race ever an issue. No one cared, black or white. It didn't even come up. So when it comes to the color of one's skin, I don't afford a fuck. If you're good people, you're good people. Simple as that. So you might ask, well, Ram, if you have so many friends, you must support BLM, right? Wrong. Not because I don't believe that black lives matter, I wholeheartedly do, but because I don't support organizations that are predicated on destructive lies. It's odd, isn't it, that as our nation becomes increasingly tolerant and racists are pushed further and further to the fringes of polite society, the socio-political rancor about rampant racism only ramps up. On the ground, our social circles have expanded and become more diverse. People of all stripes work and play together as the historical shadows of a less integrated time fade away. After all, we are a land that had slavery before we were even a nation. 
a nation that suffered under a hundred years of Jim Crow segregation. We have a Democrat party that went to war in part to protect their right to own slaves and then formed the KKK to enforce segregation laws in the Jim Crow South. Now they say that in the 1960s the parties flipped, that Democrats suddenly became the party for black people. But does that even make sense? I mean, how does a party defined by more than a century of racial brutalism all of a sudden become the all-inclusive good guys? It's kind of like thinking that by 1955, the Nazis would have been building synagogues in Berlin. I don't buy it for a rusty red penny. As the civil rights movement gained steam, the writing was on the wall for Democrats' overt methods of racism, and they shifted their strategies from overt racism into the subversive racism of dependence and cultural sabotage. They created welfare programs to help poor blacks, knowing that keeping them complacent with just enough to get by would suck the wind from their sails. From struggle comes hustle, and the Democrats wanted to see none of that from blacks in an integrated society. They went on to make welfare checks contingent upon single motherhood, all but guaranteeing that father figures would be of sparse influence on young black men, leading to lives of crime, restricted social status, and the utter destruction of the social fabric in black communities. If you want evidence of their destructive influence over a historically rich black culture, look no further than modern day hip hop. But I'll let Tom McDonald break that down for you. All your favorite rappers doing downers and you make them feel empowered till they're fertilizing soil, pushing flowers. Yeah, what the little Wayne, Rick Ross, and 2 Chains all have in common? They make a living off gangster rap, but they all went to college. It's all just marketing strategy, so you empty your wallet. Endorsing vodka to make a buck and make you alcoholics. They make you stupid with Xanax, they make you broke with designers. They use the music to confuse the youth and influence minors. Isn't it funny how these rappers went from fighting to power to buy a gun and sell some drugs in just a matter? And if you don't know Tom McDonald, you should check him out. He makes a lot of really meaningful music and he's completely independent from the music industry machine. And Tom, if you see this video, I hope you're not mad that I used your music. It's just that I couldn't have said it any better than you did. But who do you think runs the music industry? Something tells me there's not a whole lot of Republicans populating the Capitol Records building. And now, with the mainstream media in their back pocket, the last ingredient of the Democrats' racist recipe is a psyop of existential fear to keep black people from ever feeling truly comfortable in our society, no matter how comfortable our society feels with them. A while back, the media was pushing this phenomenon known as the talk, where black parents would sit their kids down and essentially tell them that they were always going to be harassed and potentially killed by the police. We actually have a line that we do at our house. We practice this thing. What is it? I'm Ariel Sky Williams. I'm eight years old. I'm unarmed and I have nothing that will hurt you. It's just kind of a thing we practice at our house. For some reason, people of color have always been a target by the police. Before they became a policeman, they were a person. And that person took all their ideas and all their thoughts and all their prejudice into their job. I was about your age, actually. They grabbed me. Why? I didn't know at the time. They just grabbed me. They threw me onto the police car. I got tased that time. That time they tased me because they said I wasn't complying. Ariel, are you okay? <laughs> What's wrong, baby? <laughs> I know Sean you got a little bit lighter than the rest of them, so it's a possibility you won't get stopped. When a police officer says something you don't, don't, you're black. You can't be looking at them saying, oh, I don't know, why don't you tell me? Well, I mean, that right there is giving them, to them, the license to pull you out of your car and physically harm you, because it will be done. Why, why would a police officer assume that you did something bad? Maybe because of my skin color. <laughs> when a child is raised to believe that the world is constantly out to get them and that the odds will be forever stacked against them, how do you expect that child to grow up with the confidence that anyone would need to succeed? These parents are traumatizing their children, mentally scarring them at a highly developmental age where they will now walk through the rest of their life believing they will constantly be otherized. This is borderline child abuse. And keep in mind, this is a media-produced segment promoting this. But if you look at nearly all the major events of racial injustice and police brutality that have occurred, both recently and historically, they always happen in Democrat-controlled areas. States with Democrat governors, 
cities with Democrat mayors and Democrat city councils. All these instances of systemic racism seem to spring from places where Democrats set the systemic policies. Yet they hide their racism behind the oily, greasy veneer of racial pandering, giving hollow platitudes that Democrats trade for servility and votes. Of course, the racism is so ingrained in Democrats that even their virtue signals come steeped in racist imagery, as we can see from them kneeling with kente cloths draped over their sad signaling shoulders just a few days ago. While I'm sure to Democrats all African cultures are the same, the kente cloth is native in particular to the Ashanti Empire, who made much of their fortune off of the slave trade. Good job, Democrats. You really are pieces of shit. But of course Republicans often get called racist because we tend to downplay or don't fully understand the cries of racism coming from minorities. But maybe the reason we downplay it or don't understand it is because we don't actually see it in our communities. You know what I'm just now realizing? Maybe one of the reasons that I've mostly rejected the idea of institutional racism might be that I'm tired of conservatives like myself being blamed for what Democrats have done and have been doing for decades. Institutional racism, you say? Okay, I'll bite. But tell me, who dominates our institutions? Hollywood? Democrats. The media? Democrats. Academia? Democrats. Big tech? Democrats. Labor unions? Democrats. Local metro governments? Democrats. Corporate America? Democrats. Yes, Corporate America is aligned with Democrats for a number of cronious reasons I won't get into right now, but if you don't believe me, name me a company that doesn't rainbow theme their products every Pride Month. Hell, you can't even chew into a snack pack of Gushers right now without getting squirted with a virtue signal. And the fact that Republicans comprise a whopping 6% of Washington, D.C. should tell you everything you need to know about where federal bureaucratic power lies. So you want to have a conversation about institutional racism? Fine. But lower your weapons and actually let us talk. We might just turn you on to the fact that you may be putting this on yourselves because you keep voting for damn Democrats. I got a riddle for you. What does slavery, the Confederacy, the Ku Klux Klan, and Jim Crow all have in common? Did you guess Democrats? Because the answer is fucking Democrats. Hell, Trump and his administration are out there passing prison reform, getting massive funding for HBCs, that's historically black colleges, funding opportunity zones, and creating the lowest black unemployment rate on record, but these same damn Democrats with their horrific history of racial brutalism would have you projecting their racism onto us. Oh, but he's got a foul mouth. He's so crass and boorish. So what? There ain't a room in this planet that that man walks into where he isn't the alpha, and that's who we need fighting our fights and defending our interests. I'm sorry if this has got to be a little bit of tough love, but we can't free you from shackles you keep voting yourselves into. And now that's not to absolve all Republicans of the tribalist ticks instilled in all of us by tens of thousands of years of human history, but we do tend to be more Christian, and so we have a religious understanding that all men are created equal under the eyes of God. You can't have a spiritual understanding of those concepts if you reject God for the nihilism of atheistic dogma and postmodernist cultural Marxism. Now, to be fair, at this point, it's difficult to decipher whether the Democrats' intention is still rooted in racial supremacy or if igniting a powder keg brand of racial politics is simply a means to an end by way of distraction and division to keep our focus off of their globalist dirty dealings. But the methodology is the same. Concoct a dishonest narrative that you will never be accepted in American society and repeat it until it is tattooed upon the American psyche. Until we live the lie. They tell you to live their lie, then speak your truth, no matter the relationship between your truth and the truth. They push you to subjectify the world because subjectivity is malleable, moldable. But the saying isn't, your truth shall set you free, it's the truth shall set you free. Your truth simply makes you a slave to your cultural influences. Politicians in the media know this. They know that your truth is only in service to the narrative, and when you buy into the narrative, you sell out the truth. So they tell us that police are out there hunting down black people for sport. But it's not the truth. Far from it. According to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, we had around 10 million arrests in 2019, which is more than there should be, I believe. During those 10 million arrests, we had 1,004 fatal police shootings. Of those 1,004 fatal police shootings, 
only 41 of the victims were unarmed. Of those 41 unarmed victims shot, only nine of them were black. At this point, you're reaching better chance of getting struck by lightning odds. 19 of them were white, by the way. And while each and every one of them is a tragedy, it does not paint the picture of a society where blacks are being killed by the police with impunity. Quite the opposite, actually. While the media is quick to jump on the death of every black man at the hands of police, you'll never hear a mention of the research done by Peter Moskos for New York City University's John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Study, More Whites Killed by Police Than Blacks. Author and Nobel Prize winner Toni Morrison caused controversy when she recently said that she wants to see a police officer shoot an unarmed white teenager in the back. Only then will she agree that the conversation about race is over. But Morrison's wish is already a reality. This is the conversation. I want to see a cop shoot a white unarmed teenager in the back, said Miss Morrison, and I want to see a white man convicted for raping a black woman. Then when you ask me, is it over? I will say yes. Well, there you have it. I guess it's all over, guys. Let's go home. These comments reflect a common view that black Americans are systemically targeted by the police. However, analysis released over the weekend shows that more white people die at the hands of law enforcement officers than any other race. Peter Moskos, an assistant professor at New York City University's John Jay College of Criminal Justice, has concluded that during the period ranging from May 2013 to April 2015, roughly 49% of those killed by law enforcement officers were white while only 30% were black. Investigators from ProPublica came about with similar findings using FBI data from 1980 to 2012. Even the fact-checking PolitiFact concluded that more whites than blacks had been killed by police from 1999 to 2011. You'll never hear about that in the news. You'll also never hear about it when an unarmed white man gets killed by police officers, even though it happens at a much higher rate. Literally, no one gives a fuck. So you'll never hear about Gilbert Collar, an 18-year-old student at University of South Alabama who was naked and unarmed when he was shot to death by a black cop. It doesn't fit the narrative. You'll never hear about Tony Tempa, who was killed by police in almost the exact same fashion as George Floyd. It doesn't fit the narrative. You'll never hear about Daniel Shaver, an unarmed white man who was murdered by the Mesa, Arizona police as he crawled on his hands and knees, crying and pleading for his life. They'll never show you this video. And warning, it is pretty disturbing. The cop in that case was acquitted of all charges. Now try telling his family, his children, about their white privilege. But again, that doesn't fit the narrative. If it's really about police brutality and all cops are bastards, why wouldn't you highlight it on all fronts? Because it's not about police brutality. It's about undermining the true and genuine progress America has made, both domestically and through our influence on the world stage. The truth is, our institutions and pillars of cultural influence have all been commandeered by pinko communist activists with a much larger agenda. And this leads us to the biggest lie of it all. None of this is even about dealing with racism. So tune into part two of this series as I break down how anti-American activists are using Black Lives Matter as a skin suit to further their quest in tearing apart America. Spoiler alert, it isn't about black lives. Not one bit. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. I'm going to try to put out one or two of these videos a week, but I do work a full-time job, so if you're interested in seeing more frequent content, please consider contributing to my Subscribestar, Patreon, or PayPal accounts listed below, and don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Ram Thorburn. And as always, rev your engines, ride hard, and fight like hell. Every time who I am.